The annual league meetings are wrapping up here in Orlando. Mike McDonald had a chance to speak with local media. What are the big takeaways coming out of Orlando? I'll be diving in on our new Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined here on our Tuesday show by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening on the other side of the state in Cheney, Washington, or in the middle of the country in Davenport, Iowa. Greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. The NFL League meetings are wrapping up in Orlando. Local media, including myself, had an opportunity to chat with Mike McDonald today at the Ritz-Carlton here in Orlando. Going to be diving into some of the key takeaways from that media availability, including McDonald's thoughts on some of the new rule changes that have been put in place here this week in Orlando. And then we're going to look at Washington and Washington State's upcoming pro days. Rob's really excited for that as we preview some players to look at as potential Seahawk targets that'll be working out this week. And a couple of veteran guards who may be on the radar for the Seahawks as they continue to try to boost their offensive line. It's a jam packed episode brought you away by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Now for your lead story here on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. For the first time as the new head coach of the Seahawks, Mike McDonald met with local media this morning at the NFL annual meetings to address a number of topics from football-related stuff to rules, discussing free agency, you name it. It was an extensive conversation with the new head coach as he continues his uh, process of replacing Pete Carroll. Rob, the first big thing that I want to discuss, so when we looked at this yesterday, we had fans asking us about the new hip drop rule. I asked Mike McDonald about his thoughts on that rule, on how it may impact NFL defenses. And players might be whining, but I don't think that Mike McDonald is going to be one that's going to be upset about this rule. Take a listen. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're going to be able to adapt to it. Um, it's a, You watch these plays, and it's – it is a dangerous play, man. But it's something that it's a it's a maneuver that we got to get out of the game. You know, it's just it's uh it's too dangerous. Of you know, to the the guys carrying the ball, and uh, I understand. You know, there's a lot of rules that have been implemented for on how we're playing defense in this league, and um, I think it goes to how well we coach tackling again. I mean, it puts a premium on how we're coaching it as a fundamental throughout the for the for our team. And, you know, obviously definitely not coaching anything close to that. But if the guys are doing it the right way consistently, I think they'll feel confident. Then they don't have to resort, you know, to that to that specific movement. And, um, and, I, and I, think, I think it's better for the game overall. So players, Rob, might be complaining about this rule. But it's clearly evident that Mike McDonald is not going to be in that company. And listening to his explanation, uh, he changed my opinion. And I've looked at some data over the last 24 hours as well that uh, – Maybe we are putting way too much controversy with this rule change. I think a lot of people are putting too much controversy. In. I mean, you know, tackling is something that uh, has to be coached, even at the NFL level. It's one of the things you and I, of course, have bemoaned in the past. Um, that the Seahawks didn't do enough actual live tackling um, during the uh, the practices that we saw at training camp and in mini camps in the past. Um, I think that if you – are able to wrap up what you see, um, that you use your arms, you use your shoulders, rather than grabbing on the cloth and pulling backwards in pursuit, then that is really where a lot of these tackle issues have uh, come about. I 100% agree with what Mike McGall just basically said there, is that this is a, a coaching, this is a, this is something that is going to be a challenge to Seattle's coaching staff. I think less so a challenge to Seattle's defenders and, and players on special teams who are making tackles. Um, I, I think that this really, what this comes down to is, again, technique, 
It comes down to physicality. Most of the incorrect tackles that have resulted in injuries have been kind of um, desperation type of tackles. And so, again, for a guy who is as acknowledged as a teacher as Mike McDonald is, I don't. I think this is much ado about nothing, frankly. And I think that you're going to see most quality defensive players, which of course is Mike McDonald's specialty, are going to actually gravitate and like this change rather than bemoan it the way that some have. And I think Seahawks fans will be really excited if the tackling is just better in general, because that has been a huge problem the last couple of years under Pete Carroll and his staff. And early on in his tenure, that was not as big of an issue, but it has continually gotten worse the last couple of years. So that's going to be one of the big tests for him and his coaching staff, especially with this rule. And throughout this morning's media availability, of course, there were specifics on Rayshon Jenkins and Tyrell Dodson and Jerome Baker, some of these newcomers that the Seahawks have added in free agency, but Uh, The real point of all the answers that McDonald gave is that this team, they were looking to build a strong spine on defense. And what he means by that is the middle. They needed to fortify the middle. They get a 340-plus pound nose tackle in Jonathan Hankins. They re-sign Leonard Williams. They get Dotson and Baker. Baker, in particular, with his experience to play those linebacker spots, the athleticism to play those spots in this scheme. And you get the versatile safeties in Rayshon Jenkins and Kayvon Wallace, who can play both spots. They can play in the nickel as well. Julian Love already could do that. So now you've got three interchangeable parts that help with pre-snap disguise and all those things. So that has been the number one priority this offseason. And you may not necessarily agree with all the players that they brought in from a fan perspective, at least our listeners. But, Rob, I do think that that is something that they have been able to attack and do a pretty good job of building that strong spine in the middle of their defense. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Um, again, I, I have really been excited about the additions that the Seahawks have made. And I, I say additions, uh, I very much include Leonard Williams as, as part of that. Um, but definitely focusing in first on a guy that your new defensive coordinator, Adam Durde, is going to know very, very well with Jonathan Hankins, um, of course, who we coached previously with the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and anytime you're going to be talking about the spine or the middle of the defense, that's where you got to start off with um, was the big nose guard in this particular scheme. And as I've said in multiple shows now, I am very excited about Tyrell Dodson in particular and his explosive upfield uh, speed and power. Um, that is something that I think that, frankly, the Seahawks have been missing at the linebacker position for a while now. Mike Holmgren used to call him thumpers. That you want a guy in the middle who is a thumper that will knock you on your butt. You don't have to worry about hip drop tackles because these are almost head-on head collisions at, at times. And I certainly don't want that either. But at the same time, you do want a different degree of physicality, of toughness, of intimidation than the Seahawks on defense that have had for the last couple of years. That's what I expect for Mike McDonald. And you mentioned the two safeties as well. Again, just a greater element of, of real uh real physicality you, you would see flashes with jamal adams flashes with some of the big hits from quandre Diggs, but not consistent when, when's the last time you thought about a seahawks opposing wide receiver or tight end and whether they thought about the big hit coming down from a cam chancellor or earl thomas we, look with all due respect to jamal adams and quandre Diggs, there wasn't that fear factor about from opposing pass catchers uh, when they're going up against the Seahawks defense. I think that this new group of players the Seahawks have brought in during free agency, again, including Leonard Williams, I think it's going to bring back that fear factor and see how spine is going to be that much stouter as a result. That clearly was the most exciting development this offseason, just hearing from Mike McDonald. He was fired up about what they've been able to do in the middle of that defense at all three levels, bringing in that toughness, that physicality, and in most cases, flexibility position-wise. On the opposite end of the spectrum, and this shouldn't come as a surprise, McDonald was pretty blunt about the state of the offensive line, saying that there's still much work to do. And you look at the moves they've made, Tremaine Ankrum is the only signing that they've had from an outside free agent at guard. Nick Harris is a backup at center to compete with Oluwatimi. There are not many moves that have been made on that front. And so, not surprisingly, 
He said that it's still a work in progress. John Schneider echoed that as well. And we'll talk later about how the Seahawks can still try to address this before the draft. But, Rob, this is clearly the other end of the spectrum. This is the big glaring weakness still for this football team. Yeah, it is. And that's one of the reasons why there's so many of these mock drafts that have the Seahawks, you know, staying pat number 16 overall or trading down slightly, but still prioritizing offensive linemen. It would make a great deal of sense just because, again, that is, is if you just looked at Seattle's roster, there's a glaring hole at left guard. And perhaps you still are looking for a little bit more competition at the center and tackle positions behind Seattle's presumptive starters. Um, but again, this sets up very well for John Schneider's um, um, specialty, and that, of course, is on draft day, uh, where, again, I think that the offensive line group this year is as good as I've ever seen. I've been doing this for 25 years now. Yeah, that's a great point, and John Schneider made sure to echo that as well when we talked to him today, that, look, this is a really good draft class. So that has been part of the blueprint here, why they've gone with other positions in free agency and maybe that's why the linebacker position went so fast as well when you're looking from a draft perspective so all these things are linked they're intertwined but the Seahawks clearly know that they've got some depth concerns they've got some starter concerns especially at those guard spots and they're going to continue looking for ways that they can attack that here in the second third wave of free agency up next we've got pro days coming up in the state of Washington UW and Washington State both going to have their pro days this week. Rob and I are going to be diving into some of the top prospects to keep an eye on from a Seahawks perspective. That's coming up next year on our Tuesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry or start ripping your hair out and looking like me when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. So if you want to see the Seattle Kraken at Climate, Pre uh, Climate Pledge Arena as they close out the season, Thanks to Game Time's awesome flash deals feature and a detailed stadium map, you can get awesome seats for under $100. And it's super easy. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. And with the Game Time guarantee, you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use the code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang, and a special thanks to all the twelves tuning in and making Locked On Seahawks your first listen. Five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have you had to turn the volume down with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the best, biggest, best stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Rob, I know that we are in the heat of pro day season and you with your scouting background, your NFL draft background, these are the dog days of spring for you. In particular, uh, literally dog days of spring. We're talking about UW's pro day coming up this week, as well as the Washington State Cougars. You'll also be checking out Idaho and Eastern Washington as well. So uh, you're going to be a very busy man this week. Let's focus on the two big schools in state okay. and Washington advanced to the national championship game last year, losing to Alabama. Tons of talent coming off of that team going to be available in the draft. And I know that you are going to be keeping a very close eye in particular on the bevy of offensive prospects that'll be working out for the Huskies. Yeah, not only will I be doing that, of course, Seattle's uh, you know new offensive coordinator, previously Washington's offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, is expected to be there. Scott Huff, previously Washington's offensive line coach, now the Seahawks' offensive line coach. He might be um, on hand at Montlake for the University of Washington Pro Day. And as you said, Corbin, I mean, this is truly a historic class of Huskies. Um, there were 13 players. That is the biggest 
number ever from the University of Washington. 13 players that were invited to the combine. There's going to be 19 Huskies that are going to be working out at the UW uh, Pro Day on Thursday. That's the highest number I've ever seen. And I've been going to Washington Pro Days here for about 20 years now. Um, and so there's just so many players that make an awful lot of sense for the Seahawks really to be focusing in on. Uh, let's start the conversation with quarterback Michael Penix Jr. I think that it's unlikely that he is going to be a Seahawk given the uh, trade for Sam Howell here recently. But there certainly is a possibility, and obviously nobody is going to know him better than his former offensive coordinator. Um, and so I do think that's going to be a fascinating storyline. Then, of course, the three wide receivers, all of them are going to wind up being drafted. Roma Dunze could perhaps be off the board um, by the time the Seahawks are on at number 16 overall. I certainly expect him to be so. I think that he is a top 10 prospect. But between Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, Jalen uh, McMillan, um, the tight ends uh, are very good. Devin Culp was the fastest tight end um, in the 40-yard dash at the Combine. So he is not likely to do the 40-yard the dash testing. But, you know, people are curious to see how he does in the positional workout and his, um, you know, the, the drills as far as the change of direction type of drills, short shuttle and three, cone th uh, three cones, uh, things of that nature. Jack Westover is a player that you and I have, of course, gushed about so many times before. But really, I think a lot of the attention has to focus in on University of Washington's two tackles. Roger Rosengarten at the right tackle position, a very underrated prospect, in my opinion, throughout this entire process. And of course, Troy Fotano, we've talked about so many times before, he just feels like a plug and play kind of a fit for the Seahawks. If, in my opinion, if there is one player at the University of Washington that just fits in best for the Seahawks as far as being able to come in and make an immediate impact for Mike McDonald's squad, then Troy Fototano would be the one that I feel the best about. Yeah, and you look at this workout, I don't know from an athletic testing standpoint if Fotano is going to do much because he had a really good performance at the Combine. He might just do positional work, which is fine. Rosengarten, this would be a great opportunity for him to build on his draft stock, particularly from a testing standpoint. Westover did not do any testing because he was recovering from a surgery on his hand at the combine and he hinted that he might be able to do some stuff at his pro day. So I'm curious to see if he gets a chance to maybe do some running, do some athletic testing. I don't know if he's going to be catching footballs yet, but a chance for him to put his name back on the map. And I think he would test very well. This is an explosive athlete. And then you look at guys that did participate in the combine that might be looking to have a better workout. Dylan Johnson will be the top of that list for me. He didn't run quite as fast as I expected didn't do a lot of the other testing because he wasn't 100% after being really banged up at the end of the season. I would expect that this is going to be a big day for him as well, and I would think that he's going to do more of the athletic testing than what he did at Indianapolis because he should be healthier than he was at this time a month ago. So I do think that there's some guys that could gain some draft stock with this pro day, and then you got guys like Fontana, who's clearly a first-round selection. I don't know that much is going to hinder on this pro day performance, but players like Westover, Johnson for different reasons, Rosengarten. Those are kind of players that I would anticipate in the offensive side of the ball. This is going to be a great chance for them to be able to improve their stock in front of pro scouts and pro coaches at Mott Lake. Now let's shift gears over to the other school in Washington, Rob. And I know there's some sour grapes right now because uh, Pat Chun is now going to Washington, the Washington State Athletic Director. So uh, it continues to be a instance where it seems like one school is stealing from the other and they're no longer conference foes as well. But moving away from all of that drama, Washington State does not have near the incoming NFL talent that is in this draft class. And yet there are still a handful of names that are really intriguing. The one that I'm fascinated by from a Seahawks perspective, is Brennan Jackson, their edge rusher, who has some rushing ability and also is a solid run defender as well. From a depth perspective, I could see him actually being a decent fit in Mike McDonald's scheme. No, I 100% agree with you. Uh, I think there's a number of defensive prospects, both in Seattle at the University of Washington workout as well as uh, – um, you know, at Wazoo's workout, Brian Jackson's a good football player. Um, you know, he, he's kind of, some people are going to consider him a bit of a tweener. He, he's more in that, that 6'4", 260 pound range. Um, he actually wound up being faster in the 40 yard dash of the combine than, um, 
than Braven Trice. University of Washington's more celebrated pass rusher was. That's why Braven Trice is kind of, you know, his stock is settling a little bit more into the middle rounds at this point would be my number 11 rated outside linebacker slash edge type of prospect. And Brian Jackson's right behind him at number 13 overall. Uh, Brian Jackson, like Braylon Trice is physical at the point of attack, also has some pass rush ability. He's not the most explosive athlete, but he's a hell of a football player. And so he is a guy, kind of a guy that I think that the Seahawks are going to definitely be paying a great deal of attention to during the middle rounds. Um, another pass rusher from Washington State that is a very good one is Ron Stone. Ron Stone wasn't invited to the combine, which is a testament to this year's depth as far as edge rushers. But in my opinion, there is not a more productive, more proven edge rusher who was left out of the combine than Ron Stone. So I apologize for the bell. We're recording this uh, podcast here from school because, as we just talked about, I'm basically going to be on the road once uh, you know, once the, the school day ends today going to these respective pro days. So, again, Corb, I, I'm really excited about the edge rushers here. I want to go kind of go back to the University of Washington for a, minute, a moment with uh, Edu, Eddie Ulafoscio, the linebacker, who had a spectacular showing at the Combine a couple of weeks ago. And so kind of like what we talked about before with some of the players that are not likely to do the measured tests again, I don't expect Ulafoscio to run the 40 or do the vertical jump or any of those kind of things because he was as impressive as any linebacker for any player, for any program in the entire country with what he's put on tape at Indianapolis. But I think that his positional workout is going to be one that a lot of people are going to be paying attention to. Of course, the Seahawks with their needs at linebacker and their familiar with the UW program, this is a huge opportunity for the Alaska native to prove that he deserves to get that opportunity at the NFL level rather than the Canadian Football League. Yeah, I think the two biggest potential winners when we're looking at these pro days, Stone, Ron Stone from Washington State, because of his production and not getting a combine invite. If he tests well, maybe he gets back on that radar to be a mid-day three pick. And then from Washington's perspective, to me, Westover is the other one. If he's able to work out because he didn't do so in Indianapolis. I think those two players have the most to gain this week in terms of getting athletic testing done on field workouts, maybe for Westover. We don't know where he stands coming off that hand surgery, but those two players I think have the most to gain heading into these pro days. And both could be intriguing fits for the Seahawks as day three draft candidates as well when we come back as we discussed earlier mike mcdonald hit the hammer on the nail there's still a lot of work to do in the offensive line there are two veterans in particular that could still be free agent options for the seahawks at the guard spots we are going to discuss and debate the merits of dalton reisner versus lake and tomlinson we'll get to that here in a moment on our tuesday edition of locked on seahawks This episode is brought your way by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney with March Madness officially underway. Whether you're betting on a big upset like North Carolina State continuing to advance in the tournament or a one seed to go all the way, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Whether you think it's going to be a blue blood like UConn or a Cinderella like Iowa State, all options are on the table at your fingertips. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And as always, a special thanks to each and every one of the 12s out there. Thanks for tuning in and making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Here in Orlando for this show, the NFL Annual League meeting is wrapping up today. Got to hear from Mike McDonald as well as John Schneider McDonald in particular discussing the offensive line, saying that it's still very much a work in progress. You look at the guard depth chart right now. If they had a game tomorrow, which we know they don't, Rob, but if they did, your starters would be Tremaine Ancrum at left guard and Anthony Bradford at right guard. And then you'd have McClendon Curtis as the main backup behind those two. So depth and starting talent is certainly an area of concern. And while the Seahawks don't have a lot of cap space, there are two veterans that I've heard some murmurs down here in Orlando that the Seahawks are at least kicking the tires on. 
former Kansas State standout Dalton Reisner and Duke standout Lake and Tomlinson, two guys who have started a ton of games in the NFL. And even though they're different body types, Rob, uh, there are a lot of similarities in their play style as well. There, there certainly are. Um, you know, these are two uh, very accomplished players. Uh, they, they were both wound up being top 64 selections. Lincoln Thomas was a former first round selection, um, you know, and so these are guys that are battle tested, played, as you mentioned, with Lincoln Tomlinson at Duke, Reisner at Kansas State, played against elite competition at the college level as well. Um, what I think the thing I like most about Lincoln Tomlinson is his size and physicality. I mean, he is a mover in the running game. Dalton Reisner is a little bit lighter on his feet, a little bit better in pass protection. I think that Geno Smith would be a better fan, would be a bigger fan, frankly, of of Dalton Reisner and the, the running backs would probably like Lincoln Tomlinson a little bit more. I like the positional versatility that they provide as well. Um, both of them have some tackle as well as guard flexibility. Yeah, I think that's the first big thing I want to hit on here. If you still have any reservations, and John Schneider suggested that they don't on Abraham Lucas today, some positive updates that he's going to be ready for the start of the season. So if you want some extra insurance, though, with a guy that can swing inside and out, Lake and Tomlinson and Dalton Reisner both have the ability to do so, though I think they are clearly at their best, especially at this stage of their respective careers, being at those guard spots. Tomlinson had a really rough season last year for the New York Jets. He gave up seven sacks. He was one of the lowest rated, both as a run blocker and a pass blocker, according to Pro Football Focus. But when you turn on the film, and of course, being the nerd that I am, I've gone back and I painfully watched a few New York Jets games some of that had to do with the just offense being dysfunctional in general and Zach Wilson being the quarterback, not getting the football out. There's a number of factors that played into that. So I still think Lake and Tomlinson has some decent football in him as a stopgap guy that you can bring in on an affordable veteran contract. As for Dalton Reisner, it's kind of a little bit different. I look at the stats, I'm like, oh, he didn't give up any sacks. But then you turn on Vikings games and compared to his previous seasons in Denver, he had a lot more issues in terms of giving up pressures. They gave up 30 of them last year, and he actually finished second among guards in the entire NFL, giving up 11 quarterback hits, and that jumped out to me. Watching the film, it backs it up, and so he wasn't as dominant in pass pro as what we had seen him, and there was certainly some dominant years in Denver. That was where he really excelled for the Broncos, but he is a younger player than Lake and Tomlinson. He has been more consistent in pass pro up to last season, and then he had some struggles in Minnesota. That might have been hindered by the fact their quarterback, Kirk Cousins, got hurt midway through the season as well. So there's different variables we have to consider here. But both these guys have started a lot of games. Both of them have proven themselves at times, at least in the case of Lake and Tomlinson, to be serviceable in pass protection. It's a little bit, as you said, if you're Geno Smith, you're probably saying, I would like Dalton Reisner because the history suggests he is a better pass protector overall, does a better job of keeping defenders off the quarterback. If you're Ken Walker III and Zach Charbonnet, you're saying, get me that big man, Lake and Tomlinson, that can get downhill, fly off the snap, and bully people at the line of scrimmage. So I think both these guys could make some sense. It really, at this stage of free agency, boils down to price point. If I had to pick one of the two guys, it's weird. With me being a running game uh, aficionado, you would think that I would want Lake and Tomlinson. But I just look at the pass pro numbers, and I look at the consistency Reisner had up till last year. He would be the one, Reisner, that I actually think would make the most sense because he has got some experience at both guard positions as well. Yeah, I, and I certainly understand that. Um, based on what I remember of Reisner and his time at, at Kansas State in, in particular, uh, I would agree with you. Um, one of the things I've heard about Reisner is that uh, you know he has not always gotten along with all of his teammates as well um, as perhaps it appeared at Kansas State where he was a team captain. Um, that is one of the things that I think the Seahawks would have to very much um, you know kind of vet uh, exactly who Dalton Reisner is. And of course, you're going to have, we talked about this in yesterday's show, Corbin, the, the Seahawks right now have basically a dearth of experience along the entire offensive line. I mean, now Charles Cross is your most experienced player along the offensive line, at least of the presumptive starters. And he's got two years of experience. And he's kind of a soft-spoken young man himself. So again, it, whoever you are going to bring in, if you think that they are going to be a starter here, you want them to be a, a tough guy, a leader. I don't mean just like a, a good person, 
um, as far as somebody walking down the street. I mean, do they have the, the work ethic and the nastiness that, again, the Seahawks are looking to bring on the defensive side of the ball? They're looking to do the exact same thing on the offensive side of the ball as well. So as you were saying here, uh, you know, basically kind of picking Reisner, it would be your choice. My choice, the draft guy here, would be to focus back in on the draft. Again, to me, there are a number of offensive linemen that are likely to be available at 16 um, that the Seahawks may want to consider. I think would be better than either of these two free agent candidates, but I'll go counter with you here. I really think that Lakin Tomlinson basically – Kind of got the short end of the stick, frankly, in, in terms of some of the grades I've seen some evaluators put on him. I thought that a lot of the poor play that I saw from him in his tape at New York was directly attributable to the, the struggles that the Jets had at the quarterback position, at the inconsistency at the running game as well. I saw a lot of times where I thought Tomlinson did serviceable job and could be a quality backup. I don't think that either of these two players are necessarily much of an improvement over Ankrum, who I applaud the Seahawks for bringing him in because I was encouraged by what I've seen from him. Uh, and as well, again, the young player, Anthony Bradford, who in my opinion still is about as physically gifted as any of the Seahawks' current offensive linemen. So again, I view Bradford as a player who could wind up becoming that not only a starter, but one of the real leaders of the Seahawks offensive line moving forward. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Make sure to subscribe to Locked on Seahawks on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on our Wednesday show, Mike McDonald wasn't the only man that spoke at the NFL League meetings. We're going to be diving into some key takeaways from John Schneider's media availability what did the general manager and new football president of operations have to say? We're going to be diving in. Make sure you're listening in and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Go Hawks.